I. From the Walt Disney World Swan and Dolphin Resort in Orlando, Florida, it's The Q. Covering Splunk.com 2016. Brought to you by Splunk. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and John Wall. And welcome back here on theCUBE, the flagship broadcast of SiliconANGLE TV where we extract the signal from the noise. We're live at Comp 2016 here in Orlando, Florida, on the show floor. A lot of activity, a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz, and a really good segment coming up for you here. Along with John Furrier, I'm John Walls, and we're joined by two gentlemen from the Herjavec Group. Robert Herjavec, good to see you, sir. Greetings, the CEO, thank you and, for having us. And uh, Adif Gari, the senior VP at the Herjavec. Good to see you, sir. Yes. First off, Robert, congratulations. Newly married, uh, your defense was down for a change, and uh, <laughs> but, uh, congratulations on oh, that. Oh, thank you, it was wonderful. It was, it was a great wedding, lots of fun, but you know, casual and a lot of, just a big party. Yeah, it was. Looked like pictures were great. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> great. Um, people obviously know you from, from Shark Tank, uh, but the Herjavec Group has been uh, really laser focused on cybersecurity for more than a decade now. Tell us a little bit about, if you would, maybe just paint the broad picture of the group, your focus, yeah, and, and why I mean, you drilled down on cyber. Yeah, yeah I've, been, I've been in the security business for about 30 years. I actually helped to bring a product called Checkpoint to Canada, firewalls, URL filtering, that kind of stuff. And we started this company 12 years ago, and our vision was to do managed services. That was our vision. No other customer's vision, but our vision. And we thought we'd do five million in sales in our first year, and we did 400,000. Mm -hmm. The market just wasn't there. Sim technology, log aggregation, isn't what it is today. I mean, I think at the time, it was Envision. Yeah. What was it called? Yeah, what was it was RSA called? Envision. Envision, yeah. and then RSA bought them. That was really the first go-to-market sim. Mm -hmm. Then you had ArcSight and Q1. And so our initial business became around log aggregation, security, writing parsers, and then over time it grew. Mm -hmm. It took us five yeah. years to get to six million in sales, and we'll do about 170 million this year. Mm -hmm. And we went from a Canadian company to really a global entity. We do a lot of business in the States, UK, mm -hmm. Australia, mm -hmm. everywhere. Right. Well, you got, you're certainly a celebrity. We love having you on theCUBE, our little shark tank in and of itself. And, but you're also an entrepreneur, right? And you know the business, you've been in software, you're in the tech business, so you're a tech athlete, as we say. And this world's changing right now, and, and I'm, I'm striking, you get a lot of pitches, it's entertainment meets business, but the, 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 the fact that the entrepreneurial activity, certainly in the Bay Area, and San Francisco, Silicon Valley, where I live, and all around the world, is really active. The, whether you call it the programmer, or culture, or just the fact that the cloud is allowing people to start companies, yeah. you're seeing a surge in entrepreneurship in the enterprise, right. which is like, was boring in the past, you know? You mentioned Checkpoint well, in the old I, days, but I, now it's surging. What are your thoughts yeah, on yeah. the entrepreneurial climate? I, I don't know if the enterprise entrepreneurship element is surging. Uh, by the way, I'm going to say intrapreneur, just the way I say it. Cuban right. always makes fun of me. <laughs> so like, we don't say it like that in America. I'm like, screw off. Uh, That's how you say it. I was like, right. I want to say it the way I want to right. say it. Well, internal entrepreneurs, right? Other, is it, is what you mean by intrapreneurship? Well, no, I'm just, it's just the way I say it's it. It's a Canadian thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but business to business enterprise, we've always been in the enterprise business. So we are seeing a lot of growth in that area. A lot of VC money is going into that area because it's more, you know, you can measure that level of return and you can go and get those customers. But on our show, we're a bubble. We don't do a lot of tech deals like we're talking because it's boring TV. Tech people love tech. Yep. Consumers love the benefit of tech. Yep. You know, no consumer opens up their iPhone and says, oh my gosh, I love the technology behind my iPhone. They just love, love their it. iPhone. Yeah. Right. And our show is really a consumer platform that is... It's on cable TV, so it's got a big audience. Yeah. So you got to well, hit the wide we're swath. We're one of the highest rated shows on network television. Eight years, three Emmys. It, yeah. You know, it's a big show now. And what we've all learned, because Mark Cuban and I are tech guys, and we used to look for stuff we know. We don't invest in stuff we know anymore. We invest in slippers, ugly Christmas sweaters, <laughs> food products. <laughs> because if you can tap into that consumer base, you're good to go. So bottom line, has it been fun for you? I mean, the show has been great. It's been, obviously the awards are great. Has it been fun for you? What's it been like? What's the personal feeling on being on the Shark Tank? You know, filming is fun and hanging out is fun. And it's fun to be a celebrity at first. Your head gets really big and you get really <laughs> good tables at restaurants. And 
you know, there's no sporting People recognize event. you. Yeah, you know. get to be on the cube. <laughs> I get to get happen every day, probably. You know, you get to go everywhere. But after a while, it's, it's, it gets pretty dry. Um, but it really helps our brand. We yeah. compete typically against IBM, Verizon, mm -hmm. and you know, the CEO of IBM, you're not going to see him selling you security. Well, I know they're, pay, they're doing a lot, spending a lot of cash on Watson trying to get that to work, but that's a whole other story. But let's get down and dirty on Splunk. You're yeah. here uh, because you're doing a talk. Give a quick take on what you're talking about. Why are you here at dot-com for Splunk? Yeah, we're, we're doing a talk on data transformation, and you know, the world today is about data. And the amount of data points and access points and the internet of things, it's just exponential growth. You know, the stat I always love, and Tiff's heard it a thousand times, is yes. there's roughly three billion people on the internet today, mm -hmm. and there's roughly six billion or seven billion IP addresses. By 2020, according to the IPV committee, there'll be five, six billion people connected and hundreds of trillions of IP addresses. And the IOT is going to add more surface area okay. to security attacks. I mean, yeah. it used to be the old days, you mean check, yeah. checkpoint, the moat, the firewall, yeah. the after well, the, the idea of the perimeter now, is gone now. There, there is no such thing as a perimeter anymore because everything you can access. And so, a lot of work in that area, and all of that comes to data and log aggregation. And what we've seen for years is that the SIM vendors wanted to provide more analytics, but if you really think about it, the ultimate analytics engine is, is Splunk. Yeah. And Splunk now with their ESM module is moving more into the security world and really taking away market share. So we're very excited by it. We have a great relationship with the Splunk guys. Um, we see nothing but future. And you guys content. are using Splunk and working with it with your customers? We do, yeah. we've been using Splunk for a while. We have yeah. a private cloud, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so you know, we eat our own dog food. So not only do we sell Splunk, but we also use it in-house. We've been using it for over five years. Uh, it powers our analytics platform, which is a fancy way to say, uh, reduces the noise from all the different clutter, from all the IOT, from all the different type of alerts that are coming in. Companies need a way to filter through all that noise. We use Splunk to solve that problem for us internally. And then of course we sell it and we manage it for you know, global 2,000 customers, Fortune 100 companies all over the world. Tell us about the role of data, because data transformation has been a big buzzword, it's a holistic message around biz businesses digitizing and getting digital assets in front of their customers. We have a big research division that does all this stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, the digitization of your business means you're going to have to go digital all the way. And the role of data is not the old data warehousing days. You right. fenced away, pull it in, now you need data moving around, you need organic sharing of data, data's driving policies and new pattern recognitions for security. How, would you, how do you guys see that evolve? How do you talk to your customers? Because in a way, the old stuff is, can work if you use the data differently. You're seeing a pattern like, hey, that's an algorithm I used 10 years ago, but now with new data, that might be workable. What are some of the things that you're seeing now that customers are doing that you talk to that are leveraging data like Splunk in a new way? Right. Well, that's really where Splunk adds so much value because a friend of mine is the dean of USC, and he has a great saying, more data is not necessarily more information. And so the mistake that we see customers making a lot is they're, they're collecting the data, but they're not doing the right things with it. Right. And that's really where Splunk and that level of granularity can add tremendous value, not just right. from logging, but from analytics and going upstream with it. Yeah, and, and also to that point, it's just automation. There's too much data, right and it's only going to go. It's only going to get bigger, right? Uh, based on the rest that route, rattled rat, rat off. Now we need some machine machine learning analytics to move it further. And you know, all all points aside, machine learning isn't where it needs to be right now. Today in the market, it still has a long way to go. It's, I would call it a work in progress. But however, it's the promise, right? Because there's too much data, and to secure it, to automate behavior is really what. And it's a double-edged sword. The innovation strategy these companies are taking—they're growing with mobility, growing the cloud, yeah. increasing the service area, IoT. Yeah. But the supervised areas of the enterprise were the doors, right? You know, right. lock the doors, and the perimeter is now dead. So now you have an unsupervised environment in the enterprise at risk. Once the hackers get in, they're. They're, they're having their way. Oh, the, the internet is like a kindergarten playground where there are no rules and the <laughs> teacher went home at lunch. Yeah. You know, yeah. that is the internet. Yeah. And the high school. I think it would be up through high school. school. <laughs> kindergarten yeah. through high school. And you have different yeah. age kids in there. Yeah. It's chaos. Yeah. Edlam. Very well said. The internet is chaos, but by nature, that's what we want the internet to be. We don't want to control the chaos because we limit our ability to communicate and that's really the promise of the internet. It's not the responsibility of the internet to police itself, 
it's the responsibility of each enterprise. Yeah. So what new things are happening? We're seeing successes, we're certainly we're reporting on companies that are being successful. Are the ones that are doing the reverse of what was once done, or said differently, new ways of doing things. Throwing out, kind of trying to do a hybrid legacy approach mm -hmm. to security, we're seeing the new ways, new things, new better cat and mouse games, better honeypots, intelligent fabrics. What do you guys uh, recommend to your customers? And what do you see in your talk this digital transformation is definitely a real trend, and security is the catastrophic time bomb that's ticking for all customers. Yeah. So that's, it, it, it dwarfs compliance, risk management, uh, current. Well, I, I, I don't know if that's necessarily true that it's a time bomb. You know, the number one driver for security still is compliance. We sell stuff people don't really want to buy. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, gee, I want to go spend another $5 million on security. Mm -hmm. right. They do it, frankly, because they have to. Mm -hmm. If none of their competitors were spending money on security, I don't think most enterprises right. would. Right. I mean, it's whenever you have to do something because it's good to do, you have a limited upcycle. When you do something yeah. because there's a compliance, reason to do it, or bad things happen to you, yeah. you're, you're really going to so do you, it. You don't think there's consumer pressure then to have to do this, otherwise, I mean. Interesting yeah. stat, um, the Wall Street Journal did a study and asked a thousand people on the street corner in New York, yeah. if for a hamburger, right. they would give away their social insurance number, their home number, and their name. 72% of people gave out that information freely. Better be a good hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> well, back to your point though, I want to get So up. I think consumers yeah. have an expectation of security mm -hmm. and how they police that is they simply go to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So if you're my retailer and you get breached, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go next door. But I think that the average consumer's expectation is security is your responsibility, not mine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on the B2B side, let's get, I want to push you on something that I, that I kind of disagree with. If compliance, I agree, compliance has been a big part of data governance and data management, all yeah, that PCI stuff. Yeah, PCI has been the biggest driver in security in the last five years. No doubt. However, companies are now sharing data more with other companies. Mm -hmm. Financial institutions are sharing core data with other financial institutions, which yeah. kind of teases out the trend of, I'll give you some of my data yeah. to get, to fight the fraud detection market because mm -hmm. it's a trillion dollar problem. Right. So you start to see points of growth where, okay, you start to see people go outside their comfort zone on compliance yeah. to share data. So we're yeah. trying to rationalize that. Your thoughts, I mean, is that an indicator? Do you see that as a trend or, I mean, obviously locking down the data would be, you know. I, the, the, I, I think it's challenging. I mean, uh, we were at the President's Council on Security last year at Stanford. And you know, President Obama got up there and made this impassionate speech about sharing data. That for the yeah. goodness of all of us, yeah. we need to share more data and be more secure. Right. And I got to tell you, you heard that speech and you're like, "No, yeah baby, I am going to share my data, we're all going to work together. Right after him, Tim Cook got up there <laughs> and said, I will never share my data with anybody in the government. Yeah. Yeah. And you heard him and you're like, I am never sharing my data with well, anybody. There's a tension there, right? Well, this, there is, a this is a natural tension, tension this is the between innovation. government and, and, and uh, enterprise. Well, well this, I think there's also yeah. a natural tension between enterprises. There's yeah. competitive issues, oh, sure. there's yeah. competitive yeah. pressures. Apple certainly right. is a great case. They are like, hoard their data. Right. Well, this is the dilemma, right? You want to have good policy, yeah. but innovation comes from experimentation, right? So like, right. it's a balancing act between what do you kind of do, how do you balance Yeah, you know, it's a great time to be in our space. I mean, look at this floor. How many companies are here? Right. Splunk is growing by 30%, the show itself. 30% per year. They're going to outgrow this venue next year, and they're going to have to go probably to Vegas or somebody. Right. I think that's exciting. Yeah. But these yeah. are all point products. Right. The fastest growing segment in the computer business is managed services. Because the complexity in that world is, is overwhelming, right. and it's extremely fragmented. Right. Right, so talk no about your clearly. business right now. What are you guys currently selling? How many employees do you have? What's the revenues like? What's the, what's yeah. the product mix? Yeah, so we're a global company, so we have 10 offices worldwide, close to 300 employees. Uh, we're one of the fastest growing companies in North America. Uh, we sell, our focus is managed security services. Uh, we do consulting as well as uh, incident response remediation, but the day to day, we want your logs, we want to do monitoring, we want to so help you guys come in and do deployments and integration and then actually manage exactly. security for customers? We do the, the sexy of getting it in, and then we also do the unsexy of I managing it day to day. Sexy. <laughs> <laughs> It's all sexy, that's why, the cubes are, that's why the Cube's a household name. We have celebrities coming on now, soon yeah. they'll be on cable. That's yeah. right, yeah. this will be a prime time yeah. show. Yeah. Before you we know, know, it's funny, I got approached yeah. by a network, I can't tell you who, 
big network with a big producer to do a cybersecurity show. Yeah. And so they approached me and they said, oh, we think it's going to be so hot, it's such a topical yeah. thing. So they spent the day with me and our team to watch what we do. Paint there try. is no Paint <laughs> try. Paint <laughs> try. <laughs> They're like, do so you guys do anything besides sit on the computer? You have a meeting, you look yeah. at a monitor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, not much of a show. Do you have a guy? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> network TV, you have to add. Someone, has, someone has to die in the end. That has to be network TV. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, there's a problem. There's 1.4 million cyber jobs open right now. Right. And that's right. not even yeah. including any data science statistics. Yeah. So, you know, so we're reporting I'm that. I'm sure it's the same thing in data science. It's the same so. problem. How do right. you take a high skill right. that there's not enough talent for, hopefully, computer science, education, all that stuff happens, yeah. and automate it. To your point yeah. about automation, this is the number one problem. How do you guys advise clients? What the hell do they yeah. do? You know, automation's tough. We just had this meeting before we got on here because in our managed service, it's people driven. We want to automate it. Right. But there's only a certain amount of automation you can do. Right. You yeah. still need that human element. Yeah. I mean, if you could automate it, somebody could buy a product and they're secure. Yeah, machine learning isn't where it's supposed to be, right? Uh, every vendor aside, machine learning is not where it needs to be, but it's, we're getting there. Yeah. But you know, just having succinct automation helps solve the cybersecurity pro uh, labor shortage problem because you, the skill level that you hire at can go lower. So you reduce the the, uh, the learning curve of, of yeah. who you need to hire. That's a great point. I mean, I, a I'm a, I think the unsupervised machine learning algorithms are going to become so much smarter with the Splunk data because mm -hmm. They, they're a, that's a tough nut to crack yeah. because you need to have some sort of knowledge around how to make that algorithm work. Mm -hmm. The data coming in from Splunk is so awesome, that turns that into an asset. So, you know, this is, this is a moving train, right? Yeah. I mean, this is a big time. Okay, go, go step back for a second, I want to change gears. Robert, I want to get your thoughts because, uh, you know, since you're here and you do a lot of, um, you know, uh, picking the, the stocks, if you will, on the Shark Tank. <laughs> in the tech world, our boring tech world, that's we love, by the way, so. We love tech. How, do you, how yeah. do you, as someone who's got a lot of experience in the cycles of innovation, look at the changing digital transformation vendor landscape? Splunk, companies like Oracle trying to transform, Dell bought EMC, mm -hmm. IBM's pivoting, Amazon is booming. Right. How do you, how do you look at the new digital enterprise and how do you look at that from a, um, if you're a customer or an investor, where's the growth stocks, where's the growth companies, what's the growth parameters, what's your thoughts? I, I, one of the reasons I love our industry, why I got into tech was I had no money, my dad worked in a factory, my mom was a receptionist. You know, and the old adage is to make money, you need money. And you know, to get ahead, it's not what you know, it's who you know. I didn't know anybody. And the value of tech is tech transforms every three years. We, thought, we follow these cycles where we eat our own young and we throw away stuff that doesn't add value. Mm -hmm. Tech is the great equalizer, because if you don't add value, You're nobody toast. cares. You're out. And you know, when I'm starting out as a, as a guy with a small company, I love that. We're going we're gonna to kick ass, we're going to add value. Well, now that we're a little When you're a young company, you can eat someone's lunch because if they're not paying attention, you could come right, in. For sure. It, it gets harder as you get bigger because now we're the big guys that somebody in their basement <laughs> is trying to take out. But you know, we see tremendous innovation in security. If you look back three years, who were the leaders in the SIM space? ArcSight, Q1, Nitro to a lesser degree, and Envision. Envision, right, right? Today, does RSA have a strategy around the SIM? They, they have net witness. Yeah. You know, security analytics, which is kind of a sim. Q1 is in the throes of the IBM machine somewhere in their <laughs> gut, nobody knows. ArcSight, who buys ArcSight anymore? It's so complicated. Yeah. Who's the leader? Splunk. Yeah. So back to the old classic team, obviously you have good people on the management team. Product matters now in tech, doesn't it? Absolutely. More than ever. Right. Yeah. Obviously balance sheet. Um, okay, just get back to data transformation. So, you know, data is so critical now, and again, it's more from that data warehouse, which still is around, but to real-time data, having value, moving it into different applications. Question is, well, how do you value data? I mean, you can't put it on the balance sheet. Yeah. I mean, people var value factories. I mean, GE yeah. said, you know, we have all this investment in machines and assets. But they worry about someone getting their data and doing a judo move on them. So yeah. data is truly an asset that's flying out of their network. How does companies value data? Can yeah. it ever be in the balance sheet? How do you I don't look think, at that? I don't think data in of itself has any value. It's the effect of the data that has the value. And it's a very singular, it's what somebody does to it. Whatever the data is worth to you from a business perspective, it's worth fundamentally more to an outside bad party. Because they can package that data and sell it to a competitor, a foreign government, 
all those kind of places. So it's, it's the collection of raw data and applying it to something that has meaning to a third party. So it's like, it's like, uh, it's like thermodynamics really, until, until it's in motion, yeah. it's really not worth anything. I mean, that's what you're saying, it's data is data. Until it's right. put I don't to work. think you're ever going to see on the balance sheet as a hardcore value because it has to have a transformative value. You have to do something with it. Right. It's, it's the something. Okay. So pretend you're in a shark tank and you're a data, data guy and you say, boss, I need more budget to do security. I need more budget to expand our right. presence. And the, and the guy says, sorry, I need to see some ROI on that data. Well, I just have a gut feeling that if we move the data around, it's going to be worth something. Oh, I pass, you can't justify the investment. So a lot of that, I mean, we're simplifying it, but that's kind of like a dialogue that we it, hear in, in customers. How do you get I that? To, what I always tell CIOs and CISOs, it's challenging to get budget to do a good thing or the right thing. It's easier to get budget to do the necessary thing. And so necessary is defined by the nature of your business. So if you make widgets and you want to get more yeah. budget to protect the widgets, no one cares. Yeah. No one's sitting around going, oh, are my widgets <laughs> safe? They are to a certain degree and they'll have limited budget for that. But if you go to them and say, you know what, we have, an, we have a risk that if somebody can attack our widgets, we're going to be down for three days. And being down for three days or three hours has a dollar cost of $5 million, I need an extra two and a half yeah. to protect that from happening. Right. As a business guy and a CEO, I, I understand that. That's great and, advice. And that's the biggest challenge still with security people is, yeah. we're technical people. Right. We're not used yeah. to talking to business guys. It's like, it's like house insurance, in a way, or insurance, right? Yeah, like, I mean, how do you they, invest this to recover that? It's a great and, analogy. Yeah. You know, I used to race cars, and I had a life insurance premium for key man insurance. Mm -hmm. And my insurance agent comes along and says, you should buy a bigger policy. I'm like, I don't need a bigger policy. It's so much money, we're okay. And then he says to me, you know, if you die in a race car, I'm not sure you're covered. <laughs> like, but if you pay me another 10 grand a year in coverage, right. you're covered. Did I buy it? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's the That's same. That's very necessary. Else. Great so, advice. Personal question for you. So if you're, your dad's had a factory, you mentioned, I saw that, you mentioned that earlier. Um, if he had a factory today, in a modern era of IOT, and you're going to give them the digital transformation uh, consulting project, how would you advise them? Because a lot of people are taking their analog business and can digitizing it. Some already have sensors in there. So then you see the manufacturing and certainly the, the industrial aspect of IOT has been a big deal. How would you advise uh, your dad building a factory today? Yeah, so I think there's two aspects to it. One is just, you know, everything we've been talking about, data transformation, data analytics, making things better. None of those things are possible unless you're actually collecting the data. It's like customers come to us and say, you know what, we don't want you to just manage our logs and tell us what's going on. We want higher level value. And I'm like, no, I get that, but unless you're actually aggregating the logs, right. none of the upstream stuff matters. So right. the first thing is you have to collect the data. Right. Whether that's sensors, old devices, mechanical devices, and so on. Right. The second part of it is the minute you open up your factory and open up the mechanical devices and attach them to a PC or anything that's network based, you're open for risk. Right. And so we're seeing that now in utilities, yeah. we're seeing that with gas companies, yeah. oil companies. You know, up until a few years ago, you couldn't physically change the flow of a um, pipeline unless there was a physical connection, a mechanical on-off, it was very binary. Today, all those systems are connected to a, the internet. Yeah. And it saves companies a lot of money because they can yeah. test them and stuff. Yeah. But they're also open to hackers. Right. Right. Big time. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, um, we appreciate the time. Thank and you. who says tech isn't uh, got a little pizzazz? I mean, we've had the <laughs> oh, group here today, for God's sake. That's a lot of pizzazz. It's been great. I mean, you guys are exciting, but we you are no. <laughs> Dancing with stars, of yeah. course. All right. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for being in the Cube Tank. Yeah. We appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> gentlemen, thank you very yeah, much. We're booked. Maybe we can get you on next time. Yeah. Okay, we're out. <laughs> 2016 Cube coverage continues live from Orlando.